Welcome everyone. Our featured guest holds the distinction of being the first Supercross champion in the 500cc class. He was runner-up in the 76 AMA 500 National Series. Also in 79, he placed third place in the AMA 500 National Series. He has won multiple U.S. Nationals. He placed seventh in the 500cc World Championship Grand Prix Series in 1982. After retiring as a professional factory racer, he went on to become one of the best riding coaches around, working with many great heroes of our sport, including Ryan Villapoto and Jeremy McGrath. His students have won over 26 AMA Pro Championships and Motocross and Supercross. I'm honored to present the one, the only, Gary Simix. Now let's jump in with Gary as he's already talking about how to coach riders to look further ahead. I'll say, when you're right here, where are you looking at? And he'll show me and I'll say, well, just think about the 10 yard rule. And I tell him to always look 10 yards out in front of you. And if you're in a corner to look up around the arc of the corner, and then if he goes through the corner and he keeps looking down too much, I've even got to the point where I get a long stick and put a, something on the end of it, like a ribbon or something that it's easy to see, some kind of tape, and be on the inside of the corner and keep the stick traveling in front of him, the end of the stick, of where he should be looking at. But if that don't even work, then... You just got to hope next time he does, he finally gets to uh, to do it. I don't know why why guys would have such a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, it, I know it, some, some do. Uh, absolutely. Now, I, another one that came up, and this kind of has to do with, you see a lot of the riders today and their riding style is, I'm sure, is much different than the style that you had while you were racing. Um, and, and this kind of comes to the, the either elbows up or elbows down. What, what, is, what is your view? You know, I remember riding in the 80s and it was all about, you know, kind of having the elbows up. And now you see guys going through turns and now they just got their elbows pointed straight to the ground. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I know what you mean. There are some riders that are high and some are low, even nowadays, you know. Um, but it all boils down to when they first started learning how to ride a motorcycle, what they get used to. And it's not about, it's all starts with your hands. The way you grab the handle grips with your hands is going to determine whether your elbows are up or down. You can't grab the grips low and then have your elbows up high. You know, it just don't work like, can't work like that. So it's, it, when they started riding, they learned to, just be real relaxed, kind of grab the grip straight on and let their elbows hang down by their sides, you know, just nice and comfortable, kind of like you're riding a street bike. And then they learned to ride that way and got pretty fast. And then to change that can be done, but it takes time and patience because you have to train your, your subconscious mind, what you're feeling and doing automatically, you have to change that. And I, the easiest way to describe it is you have to reprogram your subconscious mind, you, your feelings of how you're doing something. You have to reprogram. And the only way you can reprogram it is to stay conscious of it long enough, doing it correctly, doing it the new way, till it reprograms the old default program. And a lot of guys, you know, don't have the patience to do that. So they keep riding with a low, low hand grip. It, it can still work for some guys. I, for instance, I remember even Ricky Carmichael and David Billiman are two guys that come to mind. They really didn't have their elbows up very high. And look how fast they went. But I definitely think it's better if you learn to ride with them up high because it opens your body up to a, a more open framework. You have better leverage factors over the bike, especially when you're standing and want to ride over the front of the bike. So it all depends what you get used to. But, you know, my job is to try to get the young kids to learn the right way in the beginning. And I do get a lot of young riders that are kind of just starting out. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer working with the young riders that have less bad habits than, say, working with more of an advanced either B rider or even a pro rider who comes to you and says, hey, I've got 
some you know technique issues I want you to help me with. It, which do you prefer working with? It all depends on the individual. You know, there's young guys that I've had a good time working with, and older guys, and all kind of guys in between. If they're really trying to learn, then it's fun to work with them. But I've had guys that they, I think their parents want them there more than they want to be there. And no matter how much I show them or explain or, you know, try to get them to do something different, they just go out and keep doing the same thing. You know, riding the way they already know how to ride. They're not trying to change anything. And that's just boring, really boring. Because then I end up babysitting. You know, I, I just, I can only, I can't teach them. He won't try. What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. I've tried everything like, okay, if you don't do it right this time, you're going to push your bike from up there at that corner back to here. That could be like 50 yards or something. You know, it's not easy. That don't work. Do push-ups. That don't work. So it's just kids got to want to do it. You know, they got to want to learn. They want to want to change, want to get better. So it sounds like you've used different modes of reinforcement, either positive or you know or punishment negative reinforcement so to speak um and 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 there are times when it just doesn't work have have you ever you know you've been coaching riders for a very long time and probably thousands of riders have you ever had a rider where you just said you know what we're done i can't work with you anymore i've i've, I've tried everything it's probably best maybe we we kind of end this have have you ever had that um or do you keep working with them you know, kind of because this, I remember this one boy, he was probably eight or nine years old and he just wasn't trying. And his dad was kind of getting frustrated too. And at one point after a while, I said, well, okay, well, you might as well just load up and, and go home, you know, cause this, this just ain't working today. And then he got, he was real surprised. And then actually after that, he really did start trying. It just changed his attitude completely. So you know, you got to feel out who you're working with, what is going to work for them, and you know you you do some things where you test and try a little bit, and uh, that's part of a good coach is you have to figure out how to communicate with your rider or whoever you're training, and every everybody's different. And certain things make certain guys perform, and then it depends you got to sense their mood too i mean i'm talking now with with people where you're really training them like a fitness trainer the whole nine yards and at the races you got to know their mood know what to say how to say it at the right times know when to be quiet you know just you, you get that experience when you work with with so many guys over a period of time but the guys that are just coming to my school and maybe I only see them once or twice, it's hard to really find out, know enough about them to, to really work with them in the most effective ways in that short time. Right, right. Now, can, can you share with the group, a, a, you've worked with some pretty high profile guys. Uh, Jeremy McGrath and Ryan Villapoto are two that come to mind. Can you share a story of maybe working with either one of those guys that kind of sticks out that was memorable and or either about their personality or, or just something that was, you know, fun or, or whatever that you could share with us that would be pretty cool as a story to get, give us some insight in what, what these guys are. You know, many times we're looking at them from the outside in and we, we only pick up on what we read or maybe there's a, a, a video or something of, of them, but what what was your experience working with at least these two or maybe some other people? Yeah. Well, with, with Jeremy, um, he was older, you know, I think he was, well, when I first started working with him, he was only 16, but then I kept working with him. And then when he was in his early twenties, that's when he was already winning some supercross championships. Um, but the whole time, ever, ever since I've known him, he's been a real, a kind of laid back, kicked back guy, you know, doesn't get too excited about anything. I mean, he gets excited and laughs and stuff like that, but he, he was kind of an even keel. He didn't have real high highs and real low lows. You know, he was just kind of even keel all the time. And I think that uh, was a strong point for any motocross rider to be able to 
just not get too riled up about anything, stay calm enough that they can perform at their best. And Jeremy loved to have fun. And uh, I remember going to, he'd practice Supercross in the morning. We'd go to the gym in the afternoon and do a pretty hard workout. We'd usually go through, the workout took about, 45 50 minutes to do the whole thing and it wasn't like resting in between sets it was all circuit training so you're always moving and uh working out pretty hard and some cardio in there too and then just about every time we'd go play racquetball pretty intensely for at least 30 minutes or 40 minutes and then we'd usually go in the sha uh, sauna and take a good hot long sauna get back to the house I'm wore out I mean I'm like I'm only late 30s early 40s but I'm wore out and I didn't even ride nearly as much as he did if I even rode at all because sometimes I wouldn't ride in the morning when he was riding supercross and um, I'd be wore out in the afternoon him and his buddy Lou they're gonna go ride their dirt bikes not real race bikes it's more like a off-road bike type thing out in the hills just to go riding and have fun i mean they can't just relax they have to be doing something all the time but that's what it is when you're 21 i guess <laughs> so yeah he was they always had to be doing something staying busy right right and, uh, it was grueling man i mean he worked out hard during the week just enough to recover for the weekend and then race one day off and then right back to the grind again and then that was kind of my job to make to make sure he, he kept doing it and was doing it right without mm -hmm. overtraining. Right, right. And, and I guess that's probably something that maybe people don't think about is some of these guys at the top levels, they, they may want to just keep training, training, and training, thinking that that extra training is, is really going to help them to take it to the next level where uh, it may actually be holding them back because they're not having enough rest. They're not letting their body right. recover. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. I can see now, looking back through my career, I was that guy. I was always like, I, every time I train, I got to like kill myself training or it's not going to help. You know, I'm not doing, I'm wasting my time if it doesn't really, really hurt. So I, I was definitely overtrained myself. Right. Didn't so and, and I think that leads into a good segment is, is how, how do you, how would a writer know that they're they're over training or or under training because i think a lot of times people are they're out riding practice tracks during the week you know they might do a bicycle ride a mountain bike or a road bike and you know go burn a couple of tanks of fuel but you know they may just always have in the back of their mind goodness i don't know if i'm training enough or if i'm training too much as you as a, as a riding coach how how is it that you can tell or, or help someone find where that fine line is yeah, you know, that's a good question. And in reality, it's really simple. If you feel tired and wore out and you don't feel like doing anything, you need to rest. But guys get that idea in their head, just like I did. Uh, you think this is what you got to do. And you don't, you feel tired, but you ignore it. You think, no, you know, your mind is overruling what you feel and you, you keep pushing yourself, pushing yourself. And uh, you just got to learn. It, it's kind of everybody's different. You know, some guys can't relax. It's hard for them to just relax and not do anything. They get, they have anxiety. I didn't realize until I got older that I have a lot of anxiety and that's why I did that. And when I was younger and didn't know the difference, I just thought that anxiety was normal. Everybody feels like that. So when I got a little older, I realized that no, everybody don't feel like that. So, and, but I think a lot of guys that are successful in motocross um, are pretty anxious. I'm not saying everybody, but I think a lot of the guys do. And because I, I do have a lot of anxiety that I have to kind of be careful with. <laughs> That I can control it. Um, I recognize the guys that do have a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to recognize. 
Right. So if, if, if guys are running themselves down physically and then mentally with, with this internal anxiety, so your mind's never turning off, you know, you may be off the track, but then you're sitting at home and your mind's just going and going and going, you know, and, and we know that when people don't relax and they stay in that fight or flight res response, you know, you have these bad hormone levels that increase and you got cortisol and all of this and, and your, your muscle groups and, and everything just stays really tight. Never, you, you never recover, you never relax. And then you, you go to bed and maybe your sleep is poor and then you wake up the next day and you're like, man, I got to go train again. And then you just, you just keep grinding your body, uh, uh, you know, further down. Do you think this is a big reason that we're hearing so much about this Epstein bar? issue that riders are having um you know i think it maybe last year there were a couple of guys who had it and, and i don't really you know even 10 years ago or even five years ago i don't remember too much about it what is your take on this epstein bar do you know much about it oh yeah, oh, yeah. it's been around for a long time it's um i trained myself right in the mono i got past epstein's bar and got mono in 79 when i was riding factory honda and I was doing the exact thing that you're talking about. I was just training too much, never giving myself a real chance to relax and recover. And I think that's a big problem, man, because recovery is, is huge. I mean, I believe it's better to be a little bit undertrained rather than be overtrained, especially when you have to stay in such top shape for such a long period of time throughout the year as a motocross, supercross racer. Mm -hmm. But the Epstein bar has been around for a while. Uh, when I was training in Brock Sellers, I think it was in 02, he had, he got Epstein's bar. So instead of training him, I, I was, my job was to make sure he didn't do too much because he's kind of an anxious guy and wanted to do too much. And it was hard to, to hold him back. And uh, he had to keep racing, even though he had Epstein's bar. So, oh yeah, I think definitely in, in the, motocross supercross world with all these fitness trainers that are uh, working with the riders some of them haven't been a professional racer they're not riding currently while they're training them and it's it's easy to to not understand that these guys got to train uh, re, uh, re, recover more mm -hmm. and the the amount of energy that they're putting out when they're just practicing on their motorcycle is enormous. I mean, their lactic threshold is just under uh, their lactic threshold. You know, their heart rate is just under that when they're riding their dirt bike all that time. Their heart rate it probably maxes out at certain times and then just stays under max heart rate the whole time they're riding their dirt bike. And that's both physically demanding uh, for your strength. You're using some strength anaerobic and aerobic capacity is is way up there and then to put them through a hard weight workout and then to do extra cardio three or four days in a row during the week take one day to recover maybe and then go to the races travel and all that stuff that that's way over training and if you look at it on a graph where you peak out up here on your graph and then if you keep training you actually go down the graph you're going past the rev limiter and you're losing horsepower by overtraining. if you just do this much and reach your peak that's enough why do extra and overtrain and, and run yourself down you know? but it happens because these guys are anxious they're hyperactive and they just think they got to be wide open all the time Mm -hmm. So, and it must be difficult, say, with Brock Sellers or even some of the other guys who, in the middle of, say, a Supercross series, you know, there might, or maybe even the beginning, round four, five, six, and trying to convince them that, hey, you need to back it down and not train so much when, you know, everybody's thinking, okay, well, I need to get in race shape. So, I mean, how, how do they balance that? Is it just, you're just going to have to just <laughs> not ride at all and not worry about, you know, being in race shape or, or like that? What do you do? Um, you have to do what's most important, which is ride your motorcycle. And then the supplement training doesn't have to be intense. It could be 
everybody's a little bit different. So how much they're going to need to lift weights and how much extra cardio they're going to have to do. But it's got to be uh, tailored that you're not always maxing your heart rate out when you're doing cardio off the bike. It could be a recovery training cardio. You're just keeping your heart rate down around 65, maybe 70% of your max heart rate for 40 minutes or whatever. And then on your weights where you could do 15 reps, or say you could do 15 reps with 80 pounds, but you do 15 reps with 65 pounds or 70 pounds. Or you usually do three sets, but today you're only going to do two sets. I mean, it's just by the way you feel. And I did that with Jeremy all the time. I'd monitor, because I was doing the training with him. I loved to train, so I would actually work out with him. And I could monitor his energy level by how much he was riding his bike and how much he was training. And then he would talk to me, too, and tell me. And uh, when I sensed that he was getting too tired, we'd just back it down, or maybe we'd take a workout in the afternoon off and wouldn't do it, you know. So I always made sure that he wasn't overtraining. Mm -hmm. Now, were there any differences that jump out um, in between Jeremy McGrath and Ryan Villapoto in working with them, as far as maybe either the personality or training style or things that they did or that you worked? Yeah, with? but but you gotta remember that Jeremy was a lot older. And uh, not when I first started training him, but when he was, uh, well, he was even older. Because I think Ryan was like 12 when I first started training him on 85s. And uh, I didn't really start spending a lot of time with Jeremy until he was about 19. Mm -hmm. And then through his 20s. Um, but that being said, Ryan was a lot different. He was... Um, I mean, that kid, whatever his dad would tell him to do, I wasn't, his dad wasn't always with us, but sometimes he was. And I, I learned more stuff about his dad later on. Um, but whenever, and, and he had his dad, his dad had him doing a lot. Kawasaki, when he was sponsored by Team Green and, and riding 85s, in one year, he used 16 85 motorcycles. Wow. Kawasaki gave him 16 of them because he rode every day for a month straight, seven days a week, every day for a month straight because his dad wanted him to do it. They'd race on the weekends a lot of times in Southern California in January, February, and practice every day of the week. And at 12 and 13 years old, when he came home from practice, he had to get on a stationary bicycle and ride it for 45 minutes. And he'd do it. He didn't like doing it, but he'd do it. Well, I know Brian, uh, Ryan's brother, when his dad told him to, to do something like that, and he just put his bike up against the van and say, no, I ain't doing it. He refused to do it. So Ryan would do whatever it took. And he felt, I think he really felt a big responsibility to his sponsors and not letting somebody down. Where Jeremy, of course, he felt that way too, but you know, Jeremy was just having fun. He didn't, it wasn't like pressure to him. It was more fun to him. Where I think with Ryan, it was more pressure, you know, it was more work and responsibility that he had to do this. I think that's one reason that he wanted to uh, <laughs> retire early. Right. Right. So it seems like kind of a double-edged sword. You need to have that intensity to be able to become a champion and reach that level, but yet you, you're, you're burning out very, very quick. And it seemed also, you know, maybe the same with even Ricky Carmichael. You know, they just left the sport. Uh, and, and reading uh, an interview that Ricky had and talked about how much he, he even hated racing. He just, he hated training, hated everything about it. And, and, you know, and I, I don't know now, now that Ryan Villapoto has retired, you know, a lot of people have reported that he just seems so much happier. He doesn't have that stress. He doesn't have all that yeah. responsibility and he seems to be a different person. So yeah, it just seems that, you know, what it takes to reach that level of success, you, you can only maintain, you know, 
for so long. And I wonder even with Dungey, you know, how much that played a part in, in, you know, him retiring with maybe yeah. even having, you know, several more years left. I mean, I think it's a, a balance between responsibility, work. You I mean, obviously you got to do a lot of things you don't want to do. You don't feel like doing it all the time, but to still have that fun about it and excitement and enthusiasm. And when you start losing that is when you either have the wrong attitude and or you're overtraining. I mean, when you get wore out physically, it's hard to stay enthusiastic and, and, you know, upbeat and happy and having fun. So, yeah, it's definitely a critical line between training enough, but not overtraining, and then taking the pressure in a way that it's fun, it's challenging, it's exciting, but you're having fun. And I think some guys that, Got a good handle on that. It's Ken Roxon. He seems like, you know, he's having a good time. He's always upbeat. I think he's aware, pre-aware of his recovery. He even talks about it in some interviews. And uh, he, he's one guy. I mean, Jason Anderson, he's, he's another guy. I mean, maybe a little bit too much uh, having a good time, having fun. But obviously, when he's on the track, he's an animal. He's taking it very seriously. But he seems like he's having a good time. Zach Osborne, too. I mean, I don't know lately now, but I know when I was working with him down at Club MX in 2012 and 2013, um, he loved it. I mean, he was having a great time. He loved what he was doing. And I think those that's a healthier environment and attitude to be in. That I think you're going to do better than what you're capable of doing. And, uh, you know, your career's going to last longer. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> absolutely and and gary you know we're, we're getting close to eight o'clock and it, it, i don't know you know what your time schedule is if you you can go a little bit over and um I, I wanted wanted to ask the the people who have joined us today if if you have any any questions for for gary i'm going to un, unmute everyone so does anybody have a question for gary that you would like him to answer i had one a minute ago it might take a second Okay, yeah. Take a moment. Sure, take your time. All right, I do have one. Um, right now, I'm dealing with a little illness and trying to get training in, but at the same time, I haven't done anything. I'm trying to just let my body rest. Do you have, is there, a, I've been thinking like, because I've heard of people working off a sweat or sweating it out. I don't know if that's accurate or not but should I do some sort of light cardio to kind of get my, my system flowing quicker to get it out of my system? Yeah, well, I believe that it is good to do some movement. I don't even want to call it cardio because it depends on how sick you are, how much of a virus or bacterial infection you have and, and <clears throat> respiratory or, or whatever it is. Uh, but just enough to get your lymphatic system moving because that helps your immune system dramatically. If you're completely resting with not much lymphatic system movement, it's, it's, uh, not, you're not going to heal as fast. So I would say like a lot of stretching, just walking around, but not exerting yourself where you're really sweating hard. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what temperature is, obviously, but not where you're get, exerting yourself at all. Just enough to uh, get circulation going a little bit is, is beneficial. But don't, I, I mean, I made a big mistake one year. It's a long story, but I'll make it real short. I just over, I was getting a cold and I thought, I'm just going to train this cold right out of me. And I kept training. Long, it, it turned into a, bacterial and viral infection that got down in my lungs and it, honestly it took me six months to get over this thing i really really got sick because i had to travel when i had to race and i was in cold temperatures and it was just it just never went away it took a honestly it took six months from january to the middle of summer before i was finally 100 percent over it so I, that's when I see guys starting to get sick and they keep training and riding, man. I, it's not smart. Don't do it if you don't have to. 
What do you think about uh, rest days before a, a big race? I have a long distance race coming up the first weekend of March. And I'm trying to get some training in before it, but obviously I have to wait for this sickness to kind of clear out. I don't want to be wrecked for the race. But if I do get better, how many days should I rest before, like, for, say, 120 miles of racing in the desert? Yeah, you um, actually, you don't want to completely rest the day before the race. You could rest a day or two before that. But the actual day before the race, you should do some cardio. So your body doesn't go into a, the race day at a completely resting state. You know, you worked out the day before. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank Good you. Good question. Great question. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll open it up. Um, Steven, did you have a question? Yeah, actually, I wanted to thank you, Gary. Um, you know, you've been a big inspiration for me and, uh, you actually trained me like 20 years ago, <laughs> believe it or not, one of your camps. So yeah, you're you always been a big uh, help in my uh, racing and uh, future coaching. I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give to a new coach, um, how to help their clients and how to grow that business? I'm sorry, you kind of cut out there for a little bit. What was your question? Uh, I was asking, uh, what advice would you give to a new coach on how to start their business and help other riders? What would be your greatest advice? Well, the best thing you can do is is just start getting some experience by helping, you know, one or two riders or however many you, you start to help. And then once you get pretty good and you feel confident at your craft, try to get uh, – a really popular, well-known guy. If he's not yet, maybe, maybe he has the potential to become one and start work, working with them because that's what I did with Jeremy and that really, really helped my my career. Yeah. As a trainer. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, and, and Gary, what do, you, what do you think about the idea of going – say to the either the supercross or maybe even the outdoor series if it comes in your area and looking for the guys who are just trying to make make the race make the main event who are in the back maybe don't have a lot of help to support just kind of offering your service and saying you know hey I'm, I'm a riding coach or whatever it is that you offer a fitness coach or a mental performance coach and and saying out you know i would be willing to you know, work work with you for free for you know, X number of sessions. And if you like what you, you know, what, what we do together, then we can, you know, work something out later. Uh, what, what do you think about that, Gary? Yeah, obviously. I mean, um, naturally that, that is a good, a good way to go too, to get you some experience and, and meet other riders, you know, cause he knows people, you're going to meet people through him and uh, just to get out there and, and start meeting potential customers. And in the beginning, yeah, you got to do some stuff for free. I mean, I did a lot of stuff for free. Actually, I trained Jeremy for free. The first time I ever trained him. <laughs> I did a private lesson with him. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I've seen other people like Brandon Jessamine at a school. He came to one of my group classes when he was 10 years old. And I noticed that he had potential. And, and I offered to sponsor him and train him for free. But you can do that if you see a rider that's a privateer and he looks like he has some potential um offer to uh, help him out and see where it goes good yeah. idea good idea Tim. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and, and that's kind of how i got started as a mental performance coach i just i approached brandon haas over at club mx and, and you know told him um what i had going on and, and some of my background and he was like yeah and i said you know let me let me come down and work with one of you know your top guys and for a month and if you like you know what i'm doing <clears throat> excuse me if you like what i'm doing then we'll you know negotiate something down the road and heck, that was back in 20, 2014 so you know i'm still doing that and <clears throat> it really is a good way to get to get out there is just to offer your services for free and uh you know and, and just just be really good at what you do and yeah. it, it'll start to take off. So I, I think that's a, a really good question. Who, who else has any questions? Jeff, you, you have a question? Yeah. yeah, I have one. Okay. Uh, it's, it's kind of more, you know, like riding technique. Is there, you know, 
would you for Gary, would you take a rider? Is it like corners more important? Say like whoops or are they pretty even or what's your opinion on? Well, you know what they say. Don't like technique. Corners are for dough. Quarters yeah. are for dough. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. But um, they're all important. I mean, I think most of the guys that come to my schools, they want help in cornering. They know that's where they're losing a lot of time and they need to get better. So if I had to choose one or the other, I would say probably say cornering is more important. And there's so much technique that goes into cornering um, with body positions and movements, controlling the brakes, controlling the clutch and throttle. Uh, the lean of the bike, uh, you know, is, is right. so many things to work on. So, and cornering is easy to work on. I mean, I know guys that set up a figure eight in their they have a big backyard, kind of live in the country a little bit, and they set up a big figure eight, and they just get out there and practice it very often because it's right. right there. And they can ride almost every day, and it, it really helps a lot. So... I'd say cornering is is huge. Yeah. Awesome. All good right. good question, Jeff. <clears throat> yeah. Th thank you. I I know that we're running over and and this is really cool. And and Gary, I, I want to give you a chance to talk about some of the resources you have uh, for for riders out there. I know you've got some videos on demand. You've got your your riding school. Take a couple minutes and tell people you know, what you have going on as far as resources and, and how they can find them. Okay, sure. Yeah, my job nowadays is more office work than anything because I have this video on demand website and it's pretty complicated. We're just updating it right now, making another huge update in it. So I spend a lot of time at the computer, but I've learned to deal with that being an anxious person. I just have to get up every so often and stretch out or do something else, you know, and usually get a good 45 minute to an hour workout in most days. And then I feel good, but yeah, it's a lot of office work. Um, somebody told me a long time ago before I even had a computer, but just as before computers came, became popular, they said, you get, if you really want your business to grow, get a computer and, and, I just say that now because it's really important to do your office work and, and be organized in your office and have everything organized on a computer to, to grow your business. Um, so I started doing that and things got a lot better. And uh, that's what I'm doing today. Like I say, more of my work is, is the computer stuff. Um, with my regular website, doing motocross schools, I'm not doing so many personal motocross schools anymore, but I have developed a certification program. And right now I have eight certified instructors um, and located in six different countries. And I'm stoked that, man, some of them are making a full-time living. I mean, that's all they're doing is just doing schools and they love it. I mean, it's like their dream come true. So I'm really pumped to be able to help them with that and selling the dvds but you know dvds are going are going out so about two years ago i started with this company um on a video on demand and since 2015 i haven't produced any new dvds except one i've been producing everything new and put it on my video on demand subscription and i try to come out with one new one a month I've been doing that real good for the last three months. Sometimes I got real busy during summer and didn't do it. But, you know, it's my goal to come out with a new one every month. And uh, it's, it's great. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, are these videos on demand, Gary, are they um, a, a part of a membership that you have? Or is it you just kind of pick and choose which ones that you want to purchase? How, how does it work? Yeah, up until two years ago, you could rent videos, but I was with a different company. But now with this new company, it's, it's all a subscription. And just to make it simple and not too expensive, I just put everything into one subscription. You get one subscription, you get all the content. Okay. And right now there's like well over 40 hours of video and 
oh, I don't know how many dozens of PDF files with illustrating pictures and text and all kind of good stuff to show you different workouts, different techniques on the bike. And obviously it's all in the videos too. And um, right now we have a free trial going, seven day free trial. And then after that, it charges you $19.95 a month until you cancel. Awesome. Nineteen ninety five a month and, and you get access to all that over 40 hours. And, and I assume this is perfect for someone who is trying to learn technique as well as maybe some writing coaches out there who are looking for some tips on how to help their writers. Yeah. It's got a lot of workout programs. Uh, I do have a whole category on uh, the mental side of racing and training because training is, is mental too. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, with all the different ways to train for motocross, mo uh, motocross specific sports type training, uh, along with all the technique stuff. And that's my job nowadays is where most of my time goes. That's awesome. And, and, and I love it, man, because I, I have my own time to work when I need to work and what I need to do. And then, you know, I have free time. Yeah, and play time. I too much about the traveling because I had to travel all the time, you know, for racing and, and I'm kind of like to stay at home now. <laughs> I don't blame you. You're over it. So Gary, where did they go? What's your website so they can hook up with these video on demands that you have? Yeah, you can find everything um, on GarySemix.com. That's one of the links that will get you there. And uh, there you can go to my streaming platform too from there, from the main site homepage. And okay. Yeah, shoot me an email, man. Let me know that we talked on here. And if you have any questions or whatever, or just give me some comments about what you think of my websites and stuff, that would be awesome. Yeah, so it's GarySemix.com. And what is your email address, Gary? It's SemixMotos at gmail.com. And it's in the contact information on my website. Okay. Awesome. Well, that is wonderful. Well, Gary, I just want to thank you for your time for coming on and sharing this. And we're going, this has been, we're recording this. So this will be posted up on YouTube and I will send out a link to this so you can watch it at your leisure again or pass it on to your friends or, or whatnot. So th this cool. will be history. It'll be up there forever. But Gary, you're, you're great. And I really want to thank you. And, and uh, you know, th this is cool. And, and maybe we'll get together and, and do this again. So um, I hope so. I could talk about stuff like this all the time, man. I love talking about this stuff. Talking moto, I know. We, 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 we could be up till 2 in the morning. <laughs> we could, really. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And uh, you can reach out to me at Tim at CoachWaver.com if you have any questions for me. All right. Take care, everyone. All right. Thank you. All right.